May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Paul is talking about growing in Christian maturity against a background where he sees the Corinthians as behaving childishly. But against this, we have Jesus saying to his disciples, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. How does one square that circle between Paul and Jesus? It's often put in terms of a difference between being childish and childlike. But what does this mean in practice? I have memories of being a child. Those who know me, particularly those who have known me for some time, remark on my memory of things from the past, perhaps rather sharper than things of the present, such as where did I leave my keys or did I take my tablet this morning? I did. I remember thinking as a child, when I grow up, will I remember what it's like to be eight or ten? I've endeavoured to do so, and that's why I endeavour not to talk down to children. I didn't like it when I was young. Why do adults do it? I used to think. Again, when I was young, I used to listen to stories from the Bible or other tales. And so often the twist was that people forgot and then acted perversely. How could the Israelites so quickly forget, I'd wonder? Of course, I had little concept of what the passage of time does. Everything was present for me. I had in many ways a wonderful time as a student from the age of 18 to 21 at Durham. They were halcyon days, not least because of what that time meant for me as a Christian in my walk and growth with God. But again, I was aware of those who had gone before me and had seemingly lost their first love, as the book of Revelation puts it, their love for God and his word in the Bible. The Bible is so often eviscerated. Take the Vanity, Psalm 95. Cranmer, I think, put this toward the beginning of the morning prayer service to remind us how things can go wrong, to bring us to repentance. Today, Ovid he would hear his voice. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with that generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, and to whom... I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. What do modern liturgies do? If they deem to include the Venite at all, those verses are missing from it. 
Why so? Of what are the liturgists afraid? A knowledge that our spiritual forefathers went astray? Consideration that we may do so. The fact that God has a wrathful side. Please turn to our passage. Page 267 of the Church Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Verse 5. Appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Years ago, I was visiting San Francisco and had the temerity to remark to my American host that in some ways the U.S. seemed old-fashioned to me. I think I was referring to American design and cited banknotes. When I drew a Bank of England note from my wallet, the American pointed to the image of the Queen and said, and you say, we're old-fashioned. Touché. From the internet. A layperson moaned about the visiting cleric omitting the prayer for the Queen from the communion service. He was told, you don't really believe what that prayer says, do you? He wrote, what part of the prayer was I not supposed to believe? Perhaps, so rule the heart of thy chosen servant Elizabeth, our Queen and Governor, that she, knowing whose minister she is, may above all seek thy honour and glory. That is my understanding of monarchy as we experience it in Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand and the 12 other realms of which Elizabeth II is defender of the faith. That prayer acknowledges the sovereignty of God as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus, name above all, Lord of all. The elders of Old Testament Israel demand, appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Such as all the other nations have. Surely, that's justification. Current best international practice. Best to fit in, and perhaps they'll treat us nicely. Sounds reasonable? But wait, how does God see it? Verse 6. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. Oh, that's good. See? God endorses collaborative leadership. Well done, God. Ah, but there's more. God continues. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Why is God such a spoil sport? Well, he is nothing if not consistent. The identity of Old Testament Israel is founded upon the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, 
Thou shalt have none other gods but me. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor worship them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and visit the sins of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and show mercy unto thousands in them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The whole point of Old Testament Israel is they were not to be like other nations. And what was true of Old Testament Israel is true of the new Israel, the church of Jesus Christ. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord tells Samuel, verse 9, Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over you will do. Samuel does so in no uncertain terms. Samuel had listened to the people. Did they listen to him? Verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said. We want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. At least the people had heard what Samuel said about ensuing conflict. But the people's response, we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. In demanding a king, the Israelites are saying two things. First, as far as we're concerned, the throne is vacant. God is king. At best, he's distant, ineffectual. Or, to put it bluntly, He's an outdated concept that's had its day, time to move on. Nietzsche, whose 19th century ideas fed Nazism, said, God is dead. More recently, this battle cry has been taken up by so-called Christian theologians. Their platform? Well, pretty much what the Israelites were saying, there's nothing new under the sun. Friends, God is not dead. He's not even sleeping. We dare to think so at our peril. 
My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. David is the only Old Testament character depicted in Berlin's cathedral. Miles, the musician, said, it's because he's a musician. Actually, it's because out of Israel's 42 kings, David stands head and shoulders above the rest. On the whole, they were to prove a rum lot. Let's end on a positive note. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. In due course, God was to send Israel a king of his own choice. Jesus, great David's greater son. Let Jesus be your king. Acknowledge him as such. King of the universe, Lord of the ages, maker of all things, sustainer of life, source of authority, wise and just creator, hope of the nations, we praise and adore 